two important questions. What do I want from God? And what does God want from me? Will you pause in prayer? Gracious Lord, as we think about these two questions, we pray that you uh, lead us and guide us, and we might learn wonderful things from your word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So two questions. And I think a lot of people live out of that first question, don't they? They are looking for something from God, because they want a bit of extra power, or maybe they want a bit of extra advantage, maybe they want some protection, maybe they just want to be guaranteed that life's going to turn out good for them. But of course, life has a way of throwing obstacles in the way, doesn't it? Getting in the road of what you want from God. And so I think a lot of people are constantly moving in and out of faith in what they think God ought to be doing for them and, and what they can actually get from God. But some people ask the second question there, what does God want from me? And being clear about that is pretty important, isn't it? Being clear about what God wants from us, what he wants us to say, what he wants us to do. If you're clear about that, there should be a deep sense of comfort there should be a deep sense of assurance and there should be real peace. Because knowing what God wants should increase our joy, it should increase our confidence that the sovereign God is working everything together for good. And we've seen a couple of real life examples of that this morning, haven't we, already? In Lee's story and uh, the founder of the, the hospice. And if you've been around the traps for a while, you know there is the problem. Romans 7 to 19 says, For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do, this I keep on doing. So just knowing, just knowing what to do, and just knowing how to live is not always enough to keep us living out of what we know that God wants for us. And so in the face of human fallibility, I'd like to consider the example this morning of King David so that we can have a deep foundation for our trust and our joy and our confidence. Why do I pick David? Because you see, David was the best of us and the worst of us, wasn't he? He was inconsistent in that he was sometimes really, really good and sometimes he was really, really bad. And so how God dealt with an inconsistent person like David should be helpful for us because we're not much different, are we? So those two questions that we started with, the, the Bible has a mechanism for giving an answer to them. This, what do I want from God? And what does God want from me? And the answer is a contract or a covenant. A covenant and agreement. You see, God made covenants or agreements with Noah, he made them with Abraham, he made them with Moses and with David. And they're sort of self-written descriptions from God. So in these agreements, God agrees to withhold no good thing from those who walk uprightly, to work for those who wait upon him, to turn every sickness and tragedy and humiliation to our eternal good. That's what he does on his side. And God came to Noah and he came to Abraham and Moses and David with agreements and he laid out how he would work for them with all his heart and his soul and his strength if they would love him as he loved them if they would cleave to him and trust him to keep his word. And apart from Noah's covenant that he would never again wipe out the world by a flood, every covenant had conditions. So when we're looking at our pin-up boy King David, we're going to look and see what the conditions were and what God said he would do in, in that covenant. So we're going to find that in 2 Samuel 7 verses 12 to 17. So here, here's the story. So he says to David, when the, your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I'm going to raise up your offering, offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. How long? Forever. I will be his father and he will be my son and when he does wrong I will punish him with the rod wielded by men. 
with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. So you've got here a prophecy. It's from the prophet Nathan. And it's just that. It's a prophecy. And so as a, it's a, because it's a prophecy, it has both an immediate message and it has a long-term message. So it's communication or simultaneously on a number of different levels. So you see, for example, it's God promising on one hand that Solomon, David's son, will reign in his place and he'll build a house for God. And that's why if we've got Solomon there, in verse 14 he can say about Solomon, when he does wrong, I'll punish him with a rod wielded by men with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul whom I removed from before you. At the same time, God's promise is also looking far beyond this imperfect Solomon for it says in verse 13, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And also in verse 16, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So you got forever there three times. And so maybe you can see how that's pretty important for the Jewish people, a forever. God's promising something forever for them, for eternity. But then, what's the other side? When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors. So it's definitely saying that it's not going to be David himself. He's going to die. And so if we put that together with the eternal kingdom, then it means that the kingdom of David will be established and secured by a descendant of David. And it can't be Solomon, because he's a sinner who will do wrong. That's what he is, he's a sinner. And will need to be punished with the rod, because the kingdom can never be secure in the hands of a sinner. And we see that punishment for Solomon in 1 Kings 11, 11 to 13. We see what happens after he went, was led astray by multitudinous foreign wives. So the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude and you haven't kept my commandments, my covenant, my decrees, which I commanded you, I will almost certainly tear the kingdom away from you and I'm going to give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of your David, your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. And yet, I will not tear the whole kingdom from him but I'll give him one tribe for the sake of David my servant and for the sake of Jerusalem which I have chosen. So we see here that the promise to establish David's kingdom cannot happen as long as descendants of David are rebellious and disobedient. And that message is repeated many times in Kings and Chronicles. You see it in 1 Kings 2. And that the Lord may keep his promise to me if, the big if, if your descendants watch how they live. And if they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul, and if they do that, you'll never fail to have a successor on the throne. But what happens in the history of Israel? Disobedient kings over and over, leading the nation to ruin a succession. Never, and with guys like this, you could never fulfill the promise of an eternal kingdom. But we've still got that promise there. 1 Samuel 2.16 Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So, if God's going to stick to his job description of making something forever, it's apparent that he is going to have to raise up a righteous and an obedient son of David to take the throne. Psalm 89 verse 35 reminds us there, Once for all I have sworn by my holiness, and I'm not going to lie to David. That is the eternal thing. His line will continue forever. And his throat endure before me like the sun. It will be established forever like the moon and the faithful witness in the sky. And it's not just in the Psalms. It's in Isaiah and it's in Jeremiah and it's in Ezekiel where God promises he's going to do just this. He's going to take a righteous, obedient son of David. He's going to make him take throne 
Let's see Ezekiel referring to it. Ezekiel says, My servant David, in verse, uh, chapter 37, verse 24, My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd. And they will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. They will live in the land I swore to give to my servant Jacob, the land where your ancestors lived. They and their children and their children's children will live there forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. In Jeremiah, the same sort of prophecy, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will rise, who will reign wisely, and he'll do what's just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which you will be called, the Lord our righteous Saviour. So you're getting some inklings about who they're talking about, aren't you? Isaiah 9, we know this from Christmas, uh, Christmas carols. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He'll be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. It's eternal. And he will reign on David's throne, and over his kingdom, and he will establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever, and the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish those. And so what these prophets there are saying is that God himself will come as king and sit upon the throne. We said that covenant had conditions and had requirements to be fulfilled, and in order to fulfill those conditions, God himself takes on the responsibility and he steps up to do what mankind can't do, to fulfil those conditions. And he does it in Jesus. And we see that quite clearly in the angel Gabriel message to Mary in Luke chapter 1. It says, You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus, and he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. Ah, the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So there's no doubt at all that Jesus is the descendant who fulfills that promise made to David. And the Apostle Paul points out also, backs it up, he says, Jesus was a descendant of David in Romans 1 3. It says, regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David. And in Matthew, and, and the psalmist, working together, they identify also Jesus as the Lord of David. The Lord of David. Matthew 24. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? And that's taken from Psalm 110, where the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And as Jesus has already started his reign, his king in heaven, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 25, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Well, that reign has started already. In 1 Peter 3 23 we see that. Who has gone into heaven? He's at God's right hand. That's now. He's at God's right hand. He's with angels. He's with authorities. He's with power. Uh, angels and authorities and powers in submission to him and that's right now that's the present reality and when the time is right Jesus is then going to come from there to wrap up human history and put all his enemies under his feet and to make overt in other words to make in plain sight the kingdom of David which he's been ruling all along well you say that's pretty good for the Jews but what about for us for non-Jewish people how does this kingdom of David impact us? Isn't that just a Jewish and Israeli thing? Well, they, they tossed that around in the early days of the church. They had a big council in Jerusalem, which we find in Acts 15, and they were trying to decide whether or not uncircumcised people could be saved. And that was a ritual to show that you're connected to the Old Testament promise, that you're connected to Israel as a mark of being in that community. The, and the apostles at that time, they saw they themselves, they were right 
rightful heirs to this covenant, this agreement God made with David, where the Messiah, who was a direct descendant of David, had actually come to die for all Israel's sins. He'd been raised from the dead and he'd gone back to heaven to reign as king. And one day, he's coming back to judge the living and the dead and establish that reign. The question is whether or not people who are not in that tradition could be part of a reward which had been promised to David. So, they have a big meeting and at the meeting, Peter points out some things. He points out first that other nationalities had received the Holy Spirit in the same way that these early Jewish Christians had. In Acts 15, 8, God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And then up pops Paul and Barnabas and they said there's been a revival amongst the non-Jewish people in a place called Antioch. And then James picks up and he says... Uh, puts that covenant between David and the Jewish people with, puts that covenant to non-Jewish people in Acts 15 he says Simon is described how that's Peter, he's described how God first intervened to choose the people for his name from the Gentiles and he says the words of the prophet are in agreement are in agreement with this because it's written after this I will return and I'll rebuild David's fallen tent, its ruins, I'll rebuild and I'll restore it, that the rest of mankind, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who does these things, things known from long ago. So hopefully you can see that David's kingdom actually was always meant to be more than just one nation, more than just Israel. It was always meant to be worldwide. We confirm that from Isaiah back in the past in chapter 9, verse 7. He says, of the, gra of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. So that means it will be worldwide. And he'll reign on David's throne and over his kingdom. He'll establish, he'll uphold it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And in the book of Revelation you see it, the kingdom of the, of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord. So, what? The kingdom of the world. The whole world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of, and of his Messiah and he will reign forever and ever. So one day, when God has fulfilled his side of that agreement with King David, the whole planet Earth will be his kingdom people from every tribe and nation and reminds us of that in Revelation it says after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one would count from every tribe people language standing before the throne and before the Lamb and they were wearing white robes and they were holding palm branches in their hands uh, <coughs> let's go back to the beginning with, to this fallible person King David how did he end up with such an amazing agreement? Well, if we look at Acts 13, 22, After removing Saul, he made David their king, and God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. A man after my own heart. There's a clue for us there. What does God want from us? I think it starts in the heart, just as it did for David. But the security we can have in that comes from God's initiative in the covenant, rather than David's capacity to do everything I want him to do. But David's best intentions, his great heart, didn't always work out, did they? King David, more than any other person in the biblical record, illustrates a full range of, full moral range of human nature. You've got him as a shepherd, he's got a hunter, a warrior, a general, a king, a poet, a champion, an outlaw, a ladies' man, a musician, a prophet, a worship leader, an adulterer, a murderer, a brother, husband, son, parent, a leader, a hero, an ancestor, Jesus Christ and the man after God's own heart 
It's a mixture of good, there's a mixture of bad. Very clearly seen there. The good, well, trusted God completely when he fought out and went out and fought Goliath. And two times he could have taken the kingdom, killed King Saul, but he didn't. And he was kind to, even kind to Saul's crippled son. He did amazing stuff. He united the twelve tribes under God. They became independent from their neighbours. He wrote many beautiful psalms. It just overflowed at times with faith and trust in God. And then on the bad side, he had Uriah the Hittite killed in battle so he could marry Uriah's wife. Killed many enemies in battle, though that was probably pretty normal for kings of the day. Didn't discipline his kids properly and ended up in a civil war. Still, a remarkable career. And he was only a shepherd boy. And yet God raised him to be the king. And he still retains that faith that got him there in 2 Samuel 7, 18. He still says, Who am I? Who am I, sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you've brought in this time? So what about those two questions then? What do I want from God? Well, is everlasting life enough for you? Is it enough to be part of an eternal kingdom? With a God who will step in when you can't be as good as your heart wants you to be? And do you know that what you want from God or what you want out of life will never be found by chasing after that other thing? Because the good life is sort of a byproduct. It comes around you and sneaks up on you when your life is about following Jesus. So what does God want from us? He wants our heart. He wants our best efforts to return His everlasting love. He wants us doing our best efforts to live according to His ways. And so if we do give Him our heart, what does He do? He, he realigns it. He fixes it. He heals it. Do we have to be perfect and sinless? Well, that's not possible, is it? It's just amazingly wonderful that Jesus stepped into the gap for us to fulfil whatever we couldn't, pro couldn't provide on our side of the agreement and offer to each of us a part of a wonderful kingdom. So, let's remind ourselves of the invitation to be part of that kingdom from Isaiah. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the water. And you have no money, doesn't matter, come buy and eat. It's free. Come buy wine and milk. Without money, without cost. Why spend your money on what's not bread and, and your labour on what doesn't satisfy and the other things you're chasing after? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give here, come to me. Listen, that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promise to David. See, that's that promise to David that comes in there. Even the last book of the scriptures reminds us of that. Jesus, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David from the bright morning star. So, that's it. David's covenant is for us this morning because it's a call to believe in Jesus as the King and to commit to following his kingship, to join in an everlasting kingdom. Let's uh, close in prayer. Wonderful Lord, you love us so much that you make up every shortfall we have in keeping our end of the agreement. We don't return the love you constantly show us as we should, but our poor response can never stop your unstoppable love. And we choose to trust in Jesus as the King of the eternal kingdom promised to David. We come with our thirst, our lack of money, and, our, and we choose by faith to listen to you, to eat what is good that you provide, and to delight in the richest of fare. We choose to love you back, King Jesus.